So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, October the 27th. It's already the last Friday in October. It seems like things are moving too fast. This is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 230. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is the way to be. So I'm really glad that you're here. If you want to know what we're going to talk about, please look down in the video description below, and you'll see all the topics listed in order. This is also a podcast on Podbean. So if you just Google podcasts and type in the way to be, you'll find it. And uh, if you can't find it uh, Googling, then you can go to my website, which is thewaytobe.org. And don't be surprised when you get to that website that it says Fred's Fine Fowl. Because Fred's Fine Fowl is also my website. It's about bees and chickens. Even some stuff about Australian emus and things like that. So you're not being sneakily redirected in there. So what's going on outside today? If you looked at that opening, we are under high robbing pressure. I've already lost one hive for sure. Second one, they're really working on it. And um, I did put the Be Smart Designs robbing screen on the front of one of them because they had to just shut it down. They're just being overrun. And uh, often this late in the year, last week of October, there isn't a lot we can do for a colony if they get through the gate. If those first scouts make it past the guards and get inside and get a taste of honey, it's going to be all over because they show up by the hundreds or thousands and then they're all desperate for resources because guess what's available out in the environment right now? Nothing. There's nothing. There's some asters. Each aster has like two or three bees on it. We've saturated the area. They're looking for nectar. For those of you who are fooling around with uh, dry pollen subs and things like that, you can put them out if you want to see the bees come to it. Dry pollen sub does not kick off the same kind of robbing frenzy, for example, that late season syrup feeding would do. So if you put out your sugar syrup, make sure that is well away from your apiary. They are going to pile on that. And uh, so there again, I'm not saying that it's going to do a lot of good for your bees to put out dry pollen sub this time of year. And, uh, but it's good for the beekeeper because it's fun to watch them get pollen. If you want to see how they collect it and how they use their hairs and how they arrange it under their corbicula and things like that, it's a lot of fun. So it is good for the beekeeper, if nothing else. Rain's coming. What's the temperature outside right now? 69 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 20 degrees Celsius. Three 0.1 mile per hour winds with gusts up to six miles an hour. So it's kind of a breezy day. 71% relative humidity, thank goodness, because they need to dry out whatever kind of late season nectar they might have. Some of you are feeding heavy syrup, that's two to one by weight, sugar to water. And uh, that's for those colonies that are in real trouble, like there's no weight to the hive. And here we are going into winter. You're going to have to help them out. And uh, often it comes up, how many uh, hives do I feed? What's going on? Uh, most of them are not being fed at all. We have some late season swarms. Late season swarms, they might not make it, regardless of the configuration. There are a bunch of different hive configurations, um, but uh, the odds are against them. That doesn't mean you shouldn't hive them though, because what are their options? They're just going to fly off and be stuck somewhere. There are social media posts of bees now that the leaves have fallen off the trees. The bees have actually built comb on branches in a completely exposed area. What does that mean and why do they do it? They did it because they couldn't find a cavity to move into and no beekeeper collected them. And they want someone to go and cut the comb off of those branches now and collect that swarm. We call it a swarm. It's really it's not really a hive because it's not enclosed, but it's a colony of bees and they're stuck. They're really doomed. So, I don't know. It's kind of a feel-good thing. They're not likely to make it through winter, period. Because rain's coming. Rain's going to come heavy right through this weekend. So, today is your day. If you're in the northeastern United States, in my neck of the woods, this is your last chance. Get out there and do stuff. Stop watching right now and go outside and take care of stuff. Because rain is coming. The other thing is, um, what can you do for your bees right now? We're going to talk about it in the fluff section at the very end of today's Q&A. So I won't make you sit through that right now. But uh, there are some things that we need to check on just to make sure that they're ready for winter. So high robbing, that's what I want you to know about. Uh, also, we went to the Pennsylvania State Beekeepers Conference last weekend. 
and I ran into some people that watch this channel. That was a big surprise. Uh, the other thing is I was not a presenter there. I was just a guest, so I was just hanging out like everyone else. And I only made it to the second day because on Saturday I was given a presentation of my own in Ohio. So it was a lot of fun to go. And the reason I bring it up, if you do not currently belong to a beekeepers association, I highly suggest that you join one, particularly going into the winter months. Uh, when you don't have a lot to do with your bees, it's a great time for fellowship. So if you can find a beekeeping organization, and it may not even be one in your own state or county, you might be on a state line and want to cross over into, in this case, New York or Ohio. So um, associations are great because uh, they can offer a lot of assistance. And again, it just gives you someone to sit around and talk about bees with. We meet once a month in the Northwest Pennsylvania Beekeepers Association. So if you're in my neck of the woods, whether you live in Ohio or even Western New York, you're welcome to join it, the Northwest Pennsylvania Beekeepers Association. You can Google that and there's a website and you can join. Pretty cheap. And uh, we meet once a month, but we also have a breakfast on Wednesdays. So I know that's hard on people that go to work and they can't be available early in the morning on a Wednesday. But that's a nice fellowship. And here's what I think. For those of you who belong to bee clubs and maybe you're even a decision maker within your bee club, listen to your club membership about why they come or don't. Because often these groups uh, have large numbers associated with them and a very tiny percentage actually show up for meetings. So sometimes the weather's so great, why would they go to a meeting when they're beekeepers and they would be out taking care of their bees? That's why wintertime becomes a time of gathering, right? So... Um, Listen to your membership and see what they want. What they really want is fellowship. They do want to learn, of course, but you pick up mentors and like-minded people. When you have a bee club that has a very specific kind of beekeeping, so you're specifically only treatment-free or you're specifically only a certain type of hive, Lands hives or horizontal hives or Langstroth or whatever kind of hive and that becomes your club centered around that specific configuration, that's very limiting. So I would personally encourage people to include as many different disciplines in beekeeping as possible. And that way we can hear opposing or differing methods, right? I think part of fellowship is uh, opening your ears and listening to what other people are doing, how they're doing it, and then sharing your own and see what just rises to the top from all of that, how it goes. So join a club, highly recommend it. If you want to know how to submit your own topic for consideration for these Q&As, please go to thewaytobe.org. There's a link down in the video description, and it'll take you to a page and you fill out a form. Why don't I just publish my email address? That's because I want that extra step in there. I want you to have to fill out a form and not just drop me an email all the time. Because as it is, it takes me hours every day to get through people's questions. So. Um, I have that step in there to slow it down and make sure that you're thoughtful about what you're submitting for a question. Also, sometimes people sneak in multiple questions. I would prefer if you could narrow it to one, but sometimes if it's good and applied to everyone, uh, I'll let those slide through. So let's get right into it. The first question comes from Dale in Saratoga Springs, Utah. I purchased Dr. Leo Land's Hive. Should I cut out the bottom to install a screen board and oil pan? If so, what's the best way to approach the project? So for those of you who don't know, who is Dr. Leo? It's Dr. Leo Shirashkin. And uh, if you Google a book called Beekeeping with a Smile, you'll see his name there. And uh, he keeps bees in the Ozarks in the state of Missouri. And he has a very specific talk about one kind of hive, the Lands Hive only. And the reason I bring that up is because it is a horizontal hive configuration, but along with that hive comes his philosophy of beekeeping. And oftentimes, you know, we see a beehive that we want, we pick it up and we want to modify it and change it out. Okay, so the way I keep bees is different, but I do have two Lance hives from Dr. Leo that I paid full price for. I bought his best hive. Whatever he said the best one was, I got it. Insulated with sheep's wool and everything. Now the first year, I take, when I get a new hive and I'm looking it over and I do evaluate a bunch of different beehives. 
Uh, I use it as designed. I use it as recommended by the person that produced it or sold it to me. And after I take it through a couple of seasons, maybe a couple of winters, that's a real proving ground apparently for beekeepers and that are backyard beekeepers getting things through winter. I follow all of their guidance as close as I can. And uh, I use the equipment as designed. How frustrating for a designer of a piece of gear to have it modified immediately. And then uh, we say, oh man, that doesn't work. But we need to give them the benefit of a doubt, in my opinion. Uh, and we'll cycle it through the first year. And a good example of that would be even the Apame hives. Uh, they're vented through the top. It's not something I'm a fan of. And through many years of year after year observing how the bees get through winters in my area, and that's key because every location has its own climate. Climatologists will tell you all kinds of stuff that will impact animal life where you live, forage, and everything else. So what I highly recommend is instead of cutting out the bottom of a hive you just bought from Dr. Leo, I would recommend trying to take it through a year, through a winter, as is, and see if that works out. And when you only have one of something, it's hard to kind of make those comparisons. Obviously, statistics are better when we have multiple either seasons or multiples of the same piece of gear that we modify in increments, or we make comparisons where one's modified, one is not. So I will address it though, uh, cutting out the bottom would be totally against uh, what Dr. Leo uh, wants to do. There are other places to buy, by the way, uh, the Lands Hives. Beersville Bees is another one. They're in, I think they're in West Virginia. So Beersville Bees, uh, they make hives also. The Lands style hive, very impressive the way they're made. That's not to say the Dr. Leo's are not, I'm just making comparisons that there are other people making the same style of hive and it's worth looking into when you're picking out which one you're going to work with. So the reason uh, that this discussion even comes up, cut out the bottom, put screens on, and as referenced here, an oil pan, which I prefer uh, cafeteria trays. They're very inexpensive. You can buy them almost anywhere and you get them in packs of 10, super cheap. They make great drop boards underneath screen bottoms. So talking specifically about myself, um, I have arrived at configurations that work extremely well for me, but then you come to my apiary. I'm not recommending that everybody come to my apiary. That's what YouTube is for. I share through YouTube. But uh, people as well, if a screen bottom board with a removable tray is so good, how come all your hives don't have it? Because once again, I don't want a one-off where I say, oh, the screen tray works really well, and then the ones with solid boards aren't keeping up or whatever. So if I keep both over a series of seasons, year after year after year, then I will see a consistent advantage to one configuration over another. So I hope that makes sense. And so when we have screen bottom boards, we do have a removable tray and that is enclosed. So in other words, it's not an open vented area of the hive. So my recommendation for the, the horizontal, the lands hive from Dr. Leo would be to try to leave it just as is. Uh, that's what I would do because the question is, you know, so what's the best way to approach the project? I wouldn't modify it yet. I'd get through a year, see how the bees do, modify it when the weather's good going into spring when your bees are most in flux and they can handle changes like that. It's kind of late in the year right now. And this is in Utah. I can't help but think that in Utah, you're also headed for winter. So um, I wouldn't modify it right now. I would go as designed and see if it works in your climate. So question number two comes from John and uh, doesn't say where John is from. I'm considering building a long lang as per your drawing. So this is the long lang straw hive. These drawings are on my website and they're free to you. So I'm going to use them this winter because of topographical and physical concerns. The opening non-hinged side will face westerly and the entrances will face east. Is this a concern or is entrance side location optional? Well, these things are always optional, but uh, there are definite advantages depending again on where you live. So where I am, of course, we're in the Northern Hemisphere. I'm in the Northeastern United States. I'm in the snow belt. We get heavy winters. So here's another example. I keep these configurations the same year after year after year. 
and long-standing observations that help me decide or share what works best where I live. So my south and south by southeast facing entrances do better here. Consistently, they do better. And I have uh, hives with landing boards and entrances facing north, and I have them facing east. And I'm skipping facing west. Why do I not have hives facing their entrances to the west? That's because we have consistent prevailing winds out of the west. So when we get these midwinter blasts with the 60 mile an hour winds and things like that, when those storms come through and they're coming, they would be hitting all the entrances head on. Now that doesn't mean that's not a death sentence for the bees. It's just not as good for them. Why do I want wind jamming into my hives? Uh, so I have them facing south because they're again, the south facing landing boards when there's one of those weird warm-ups, even into the low 30s in the wintertime when the sun is shining, it'll melt everything off the landing boards if they're facing south. If they're facing north, then those landing boards, they're in the shade all winter long. And when we get even into the 30s and the sun starts shining, the sun doesn't hit those landing boards, the snow doesn't melt off, and the bees don't have as easy a time doing those cleansing flights. So there are some advantages to that. So that's the only reason. Other than that, you know, where you are, um, you're going to have to make your own decision. I don't know exactly where John is. But uh, consider prevailing winds because what else happens is, like, let's say you lived in Chicago. I don't know if you've ever heard of it called the Windy City. You get horizontal rain. So prevailing winds, again, if they're blowing rain at your hive, it's jamming right through the entrance. If you've got a big landing board, the rain is pounding the landing board and the water is driving in. So another reason to consider where you're going to put your hive entrance. But maybe you've got a hive visor over the top of it. Or maybe you've shrouded it and made some kind of tube that extends out that prevents some of these angled winds and stuff from jamming in. There are lots of different changes and stuff, but I think you're okay deciding based on your needs and access. If you're setting up a brand new hive right now, uh, some people have shown me pictures of groups of hives they've set up and, and they like to show you on their phone or whatever at meetings and things like that. And I often see them right up against a building. And uh, I think they forgot that they need to have access to the hive all the way around it. If you're a backyard beekeeper and you've got the room, leave plenty of space around your hives so that you can work that hive from any side you want to. For me, that's a big advantage. So behind all of my hives... Also, if you're building it up against a building, do you have gutters on that building? Uh, are you in a snow area? Because if you're going to set it up three feet out from the building, but you've got an overhang and you're going to get two feet of snow on that roof and it's going to warm up and the snow slides off the roof, where's it going to go? Right on top of your beehives. So lots of things to think about when you're talking about positioning them. Question number three comes from Diana from Canfield, Ohio. And I gave a presentation there and uh, had a lot of fun. So I appreciate those people who have invited me to give presentations to their bee clubs and their annual banquets and things like that. So um, Diana gets away with three questions. So the first one is, uh, if you were presented with the winter fondant patties you spoke of in your latest Q&A, or candy boards made from dry sugar, vinegar, and HBH, for those of you who don't know, HBH is honeybee healthy. And uh, what would you choose and why? So I can stop right there and say, I started off, I got Honey Bee Healthy, Pro Health, Beekeeper's Choice, and uh, now the, the latecomer to that was Hive Alive Syrup. And uh, I understand that a lot of people mix these in with their syrups and everything else. So let's remember that we should always question every product that comes out on the market and what the benefit ultimately is going to be for the bee. Now, early on, I was putting out uh, blocks of sugar, like sugar bricks. And people from overseas were making comments on the, the video and saying, oh, you're hurting the bee's tongue, this and that. Or hurt the bee's mouth is the way they worded it. And I thought, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't really hurt their mouth. But because uh, the bees were working very hard on blocks of sugar. So I'm going to talk about that, the candy board idea. Uh, the candy board is different from just dry sugar because it's candied. It's already into a block, almost like peanut brittle or whatever. And people like to mix a bunch of stuff in with that together. And so when you do that, you look at honeybee nutrition and we have to think about what's the purpose of that going through winter. 
The purpose is it's an emergency resource for your bees. It's not the primary food. And as an emergency resource, it means that they've moved up through their honey and they've arrived at the inner cover and the typical place for people to put emergency winter feed, whether it's mountain camp sugar, which that means a piece of newsprint on the backs of your top frames and the sugar just poured over that and your inner cover goes over that. And then above that is whatever your configuration is. Um, so I did that even years ago. And I also put dry sugar in my rapid rounds, a lot of it. Okay. And so these are things I've done in the past and the bees do work it and they do consume it. And we like the idea because we also say often, if you put dry sugar up there, different from a sugar brick, but if you put dry sugar up there by springtime, it's a block. So it is a sugar brick on its own. So what happened to it? Well, what it is, is, uh, it's hygroscopic, which means it takes on moisture from the air. So often people like the idea that the high humidity inside the hive results in water condensing on or being absorbed into your dry sugar, making it now a block of sugar. And it's true, sugar has some desiccant ability. And so if you wanna know exactly what it is, for example, a kilogram of dry sugar binds 10 grams of water. So about 1% of dry sugar weight will actually, you know, 1% of its weight can be represented in water by the end of the winter, if that makes sense. So if you had 100 pounds of it, which nobody does, but if you had 100 pounds of sugar, you would have one pound of water bound in the sugar by the end of the year. That's actually not very much when you consider how much water your bees are producing in a nice sized cluster going through winter, but it is something. And part of the advantage of that is bees can't consume or metabolize dry sugar. So they need to moisten it. And this is why we're giving them something to do with condensation that's existing inside the hive. Hopefully the condensation is not directly above your bees. That's the worst part for it. So through the years, I stopped putting dry sugar on there, but that's because fondant came out that was prepackaged and ready to go. So that was easy for me. Uh, so the other thing is, if you are making, and this is just my recommendation to you, uh, there's no reason to purchase um, essential oils and things like that to put in your sugar break. And the reason I say that is because the only thing I use Honey Bee Healthy for, or Pro Health, or Beekeeper's Choice, or all these things, um, is because it extends the life of your sugar syrup. Because sugar syrup can get mold on it, for example. But when you have a high concentration of sugar, the potential for the mold to develop there is defeated by the presence of the high amount of sugar. So sugar is even used partially as a preservative because it has that ability. So anyway, moving on. So in other words, unless you can find evidence that an essential oil that's going to be fed to your bees has a health benefit, to the bee. I see no reason to be adding that to a sugar brick or a block of sugar or something that you're feeding to your bees through winter. Now on the flip side, if you can find justification, real studies, this isn't 25 stories from people that bought it that say it's awesome. Real studies that show that it has some improvement on the bees overall health, apart from the fact that the sugar is also giving them the benefit. We know the sugar has the benefits, carbohydrates gonna give them the energy and may in fact save the life of your bees. There's nothing worse for a beekeeper than to open a hive in early spring and realize they've just run out of resources. So that's totally the beekeeper's fault. And so when you see them clustered like that and they're dead, they're starved and their abdomens are contracted and every little cell in your hive is completely empty, um, that's on you. So that leads me to two things that I would do. So one would be dry sugar. Put a bunch of it in there. You can use a rapid round and that's on top of your inner cover. The mountain cat method is under the inner cover. Why do I put it on top? Now I have to say, I've never had them use it 100% up, you know, so I've never opened a hive in spring and found that the four pounds of sugar that I poured in a rapid round was completely consumed. I've had it half consumed, a third consumed, and it is good to see exactly where and how they used it. And it's enclosed, so there's no venting through there. 
Um, so I know that they benefited from that, but could I have done better for them? So here's the divide. Sugar's cheap. So you get a four pound bag of sugar, 10 pound bag of sugar. You go to Sam's Club, whatever you do. I don't go there because people are there, but you might go there. And so when you get these big bags, you just pour whatever sugar fits in that. Because come springtime, is it wasted? It'll be like a block. Or, or the cool thing is if only two thirds of it is kind of bricky, the rest is still loose. That means there wasn't enough condensation inside in that area to solidify your block of sugar. Good job. So you can actually mix that back up with water in spring and salvage it. And if it's got dirt in it or a couple of dead bees or something, you can filter that through a screen and just mix up a sugar syrup and have early spring feeding before the nectar flow gets going. Or that's when you can save it, mix it up, put it in gallon jugs, and then add your Honey Bee Healthy, Beekeeper's Choice, Pro Health, uh, Hive Alive. You can put any of that stuff in there and it will extend the life of the sugar syrup. And now you have a resource that you can put on when you're making splits and things like that, starting small colonies that really don't have enough workers and foragers to go out and really sustain themselves while they're building brood. So there's lots of options on what you can do with it. You don't have to throw it away. Other pollinators will use it too. You could feed the wasps and hornets that later are going to feed on your bees. It's up to you. So that's the other thing. Watch out for these cold weather snaps right now when we're feeding our bees. If you're going to put syrup or anything like that out. If it's uh, in the low 50s, you might just be feeding wasps and hornets and nothing else. So just be aware of what's benefiting. Now, the sugar is cheap. The fondant would be more expensive. Now, maybe you're a chef. Maybe you can make your own fondant. If you can do that and you wrap it up in some kind of, you know, parchment paper or whatever that's going to keep it from drying out because dried out fondant does not benefit your bees. They don't seem to want to work that very well. So these packets that keep the fondant moist, so fondant is always in a semi-moist condition. And uh, we have the two and a half pound packs, and now there's five pound packs from Hive Alive. But they're expensive compared to just sugar. So then the question comes down to, is one of them demonstrated to be better than the other? So in other words, would dry sugar be demonstrated to be better for the bees than a fondant pack? So here's kind of what I did. Um, I did searches to see if studies were done uh, to prove dry sugar versus fondant packs. And it is true that the dry sugar is harder for your bees to metabolize. It's harder for your bees to liquefy. So there's a lot of work there. And going all the way back to the comments I was getting that I didn't understand, bees hurt their mouths. Bees have fine hairs all over their tongue. And there is some evidence that when they're licking dry sugar or a brick, a sugar brick, uh, that they're rubbing off some of their tongue hairs. I can't see it. I have to take their word for it. Not everyone so says that. So I'm just letting you know. But what I could not find is any examples where dry sugar benefited the bees more so than fondant. So consistently fondant was brought up as something that was metabolized by the bees easier, that the bees did better. And in some cases, the fondant already has invert sugar in it. And then other people will say, but when they made their sugar brick, they added things to the sugar to make it also invert sugar. So then it comes right down to the form factor. In other words, what is closest to the bees being able to convert that into energy, which is the purpose for it being there. And so why not just put syrup in, in the middle of winter? Uh, because syrup, I want you to understand, even if it's a really thick syrup, uh, and even if you feed back honey, feeding back honey should not happen if you're in an area where you're going to freeze in the wintertime. Honey that is below 50 degrees uh, shocks the bees. And some people are just rolling their eyes right now. How do you even know that? When they drink the honey and it's cold, because I did basic backyard science and showed warm syrup, same consistency, same controls, same water, same amount of sugar to water, the only variation being temperature. When the bees drank from the feeders that had 50 degree water in them with the sugar, uh, they were grounded there. It doesn't mean they couldn't use it. It means that it took them a long time. It shocked their body. 
and they're warming their thoraxes before they can fly away for the bees that were given 70 degree and above sugar syrup, then they were able to get the sugar syrup and fly right back to their hive. So inside your hive, if they have to do work to warm it up, and they can, they warm just the surface of it. But if they get to the point where they start sticking their tongues up in there and they're drinking cold syrup, it slows their metabolism and can put them in a kind of a minor shock. That's what it looks like. They just sit there. Uh, so the more they have to warm or alter something, then the more challenging it is for them. Now for the sugar syrup, let's say everything's okay and they take that in and it's winter time, but uh, you have freezing cold temps coming right up right after they consume it and get it into the hive. Uh, now they've also got a gut full of high water content, right? So that high water content means that they have to defecate more often. They need cleansing flights. Bees do not eliminate inside the hive. Even the queen who never leaves the hive does not defecate in the hive. The nurse bees take that waste material from the queen and they're responsible for getting it outside of the hive. So the more liquid and the more solids that you have, this is also why some people want to put raw sugar in their hive. Raw sugar has molasses and a lot of other things in it. It adds a solid content to the bee gut, which means now they really have to go to the bathroom. They have to get outside of the hive and they have to defecate outside the hive. If it's freezing out there, wintertime, they can't do it. So you risk having them do that inside the hive. They can suffer from dysentery. So these particulates are challenging to the bee for digestion in the wintertime. And some people will say, but isn't honey the best thing for them? It is, but even honey, dark honey, for example, um, would have a negative impact on the bees if they couldn't fly out and cleanse their guts. The darker it is, the more particulates are in it, the more material there is for the bees to hold on board, and they're stuck in traffic after eating all those bran muffins and drinking three coffees. And they can't get out of the car, and there they sit, waiting for their chance to get the off-ramp and go to that rest area, which is outside the hive in front in the snow, where you can see them go. So, um, aside from the convenience of ready-made and ease of application, are there real biological differences to the bees in the different sugar preparations for winter? And there are, consistently. Fondant's better. Dry sugar, better than nothing. Sugar bricks, hard on the mouth, hard on the tongue. Should not have any additives in it. Doesn't need them to extend it through winter. So if you're going to put sugar on, straight sugar, nothing else. And if you're gonna put a fondant on, go with, if you can make fondant really good, and it's got invertase and stuff like that, outstanding. So fondant consistently perform better and uh, the conversion is much quicker. So number two here, it says, also I thought that adding pollen to any feeding during the winter months prompted the queen to start laying brood. So what's the purpose of winter pollen patties? Okay, so now we're gonna get into, uh, this is one of the areas that divides beekeepers. So I guess it also depends on what you need to do with your bees and what you're gonna do with it. I do not feed pollen patties on my hives at any time. Um, I did try out some pollen patties with nukes this year. And the only reason was to see if one could do better than another. And this is the worst statistical evaluation of a pollen patty. Uh, so in wintertime, I don't put them on at all. Why? You have to get them down where the bees can use them. Where are your bees right now? If you're going to put patties on your hive uh, going into winter, it's going to be your bees are down low in your first box. So I'm a two box maximum of three box wintering beekeeper. And that's because the boxes are condensed down or expanded based on the size of the colony that's occupying the box. So they need to be down low. And so if I were going to put pollen patties on, they need to be close to the bees. And that secondary warmth that comes off the cluster of the bees, bees are only warming themselves. They're warming the brood because there's always some brood in a hive. It's just a matter of at what time of year you have the most or the least amount. So in the winter time, the question is, if putting a, a pollen patty on, would that stimulate brood? So I want to give you, I want to, I want to say that it's not as black and white as that. Um, because stimulating brood, brood production, and queen laying production really kicks off in the spring when what's coming through the entrance of the hive 
stimulates their response to that. So as spring pollen starts coming in from your foragers, that's when they tend to build. So pollen patties, which by the way are the most expensive food supplement you can put in your hive. If you go out and you look for real pollen patties, you're gonna find out they're expensive. So we need to think about what's the real benefit of that? Do they need it? And uh, what are they gonna do with it? So curious enough, uh, last Sunday, I listened to Randy Oliver talk. And Randy Oliver did a lot of feed supplement studies. And where do you think the pollen was? Uh, in his winter bees. They were in the gut of every bee. And because he was smashing them. And you can see that every gut, they all had pollen in them. So they weren't using it. These weren't necessarily nurse bees metabolizing them to feed new brood. It was throughout the diet of the bees that were inside the hive. So this is very interesting. Now what? Now he's in a different climate than I am. So I'm in a winter area. If they're all consuming pollen, what does it add to their gut? A bunch of solids, right? They're not necessarily beneficial to the bee to get them through winter because they really need the carbohydrates. If the pollen's partnered with that, you're force feeding your bees. So, and this is where the disputes start kicking in, right? Because why are they consuming the pollen patty? Is it for the pollen? What's the composition of the pollen patty you're thinking about? How much sugar's in it? Because they're all sugar addicts, all of them. Sugar is what they're really after. If they have to metabolize pollen and other proteins or essential oils and things like that to consume that sugar, they're going to. Because the sugar is what they want. And this is what I've always said. If you only give them one thing, we don't know what their preference really was. And this is where the waters get really muddied. And that's because, let's say we just put in what's called a winter patty. And oftentimes, you know, there's essential oils in the winter patty too. And then people say, well, then that must be good for them because they put the essential oil in. You have to understand their psychology and marketing. And if I said this is just a sugar patty, but this patty has essential oils from plants and all these other things, now you're inclined to think, well, that has more and that sounds better. And what if I include pollen? That's even better for the bees. Oh, that sounds good too. That's all these extra ingredients must be good for the bees. But then there are other studies. This is where we get the, the conflicts of the experts, the conflicts of science, right? So beekeeping is local. Um, so proving that there's a benefit to having any pollen patty in there, right? University of Florida. Because guess who else just happened to be at the State Beekeepers Conference? Dr. Jamie Ellis. He spoke at length and showed a very sophisticated study that was done with pollen patties. And uh, the results were insignificant. So in other words, uh, you didn't really need them. Now the reason for that down there is that uh, at some point all year long, there's going to be some pollen forage available somewhere. So that might impact uh, the bees, but you have to, in order to have a controlled study, you have to shut them off from getting pollen from the environment. So the studies are very inconclusive. So I'm gonna to talk to you as a backyard beekeeper who doesn't have to max out the population in their hives and uh, who wants to stay kind of as close to the earth, so to speak, as they can. Uh, most of your hives will not need any supplemental feeding. So the marketing of patties, pollen patties, adding pollen, because I also ask this when somebody sells a pollen patty. What's the source of the pollen? What, what kind of flowers did those come from? California pollen is an answer that I got pretty consistently. Well, what California pollen, what flowers in California? Because how do you know? I mean, we know that not all pollen is created equal. So I'm wondering if by adding the pollen, uh, unless you live somewhere where there's an absolute dearth, and this is where it has a benefit, right? If you live in an area that has a pollen dearth and you put in a pollen patty at the right time, you can sustain your bees and help with the brood production at a time when they otherwise would not have anything. So this is just really complex. And so what I'm going to say is the biological differences, sugar, all the, the bees are after the sugar. The bees need the sugar. It's proven scientifically that they need to metabolize sugar
to have the carbohydrates so they can burn the calories to stay warm, to do the work inside the hive, to transfer water around, and then when the days present the opportunity for them to forage. All of that energy comes from sugar and the carbohydrate that they collect is honey. So direct honey is going to be the best thing for them. And so it's important to know that what we're talking about, any kind of patty, winter patty, pollen patty, bricks, fondant, dry sugar, those should be emergency resources just to keep the lifeline going until spring arrives and provides them with what they really need from the environment. So once again, even if we collect every expert we can find, every bee lab, every study group, and we try to find out what do they support, who says dry sugar or sugar bricks are better than fondant? Nobody. Who says fondant is better than sugar? Most of them. Some of them don't have a determination, but there were zero saying that sugar bricks, candy boards, and dry sugar were superior to fondant. So there you have it. And they do other things like say, more study needed. That's true of all of beekeeping. More study is needed. Number two says here, I also thought that adding pollen to any feeding during winter months prompted the queen to start laying brood. What's the purpose of winter pollen patties? Well, again, I don't think you're gonna see a big kickoff in brood production. That's a, a cycle that's tied with the seasons that you live in. And why it's important to have bees that are locally adapted and in rhythm, in sync with what's going on. Question number three, by placing the winter fondant above the inner cover instead of underneath on top of the frames, as you explained in your answer to another question, doesn't that make the emergency feed less accessible to the cluster if they are somehow stuck huddled to frames off center of the inner cover opening? Okay, so I'll explain this too. Whether you have a rapid round, whether you have fondant, or whether you have sugar on top of your inner cover, means that there's a hole through the center, there is a heat capsule up there, unless, here's another divide, you're venting through the top, you're not venting. If you're not venting, you're gonna find that they use those resources quicker. If you are venting, then you're gonna find that the bees will move in clusters away from the vent. What is that telling you? If you find a cluster and they'll be off in a corner in my neck of the woods, in the northeastern or southeastern corner, east wall of the hive, because that gets the morning warmth, the morning rising sun warms that side and the bees as they're migrating up kind of shift over to that warming wall. And now yes, they're off center from what would be your feeder up above. But with no venting and your hives facing south, uh, and the cluster does move up through, which is why they have this practice of being uh, very focused on the center as they rise up and what anchors them there. Brood. So as they start to produce brood, and they're going to start right away, they're going to start halfway through December and into January, your fat bodied winter bees are going to be helping produce winter brood because if your bees are dying, and there are no replacement bees, you can end up with a cluster too small to warm itself while performing all the other functions necessary inside the hive. This is why these late season swarms that I like to collect and put into little nuke boxes and things like that are doomed almost from the get-go. They're too small. They're going to be dying out as winter goes along. And then if they have this tiny cluster that by some miracle has foragers alive in spring to go out and do their thing, uh, they require help later. They need to combine with other colonies and things like that. So these clusters that are large, they get anchored. So we need to start them off early. And this is why I stopped venting and no upper entrances. I find that they now stay more centered. And as they go up, you'll see possibly resources on the first and second frames on one side or the other. And they won't even touch them because the cluster is around brood that they are continuing to develop as they go up and they're consuming resources directly above them and then up here in your next box. This, by the way, should not be two or three boxes up. If you have a colony, a hive configuration that's too large above them, this warmth just dissipates and condenses on all surfaces above them. 
So if the colony is too small, the box that they're in needs to also be small and they need to have enough resources directly above them to get them through winter. Now, if you think more is better, it isn't. And that's because if you do as I did many years over, because I'm a slow learner, uh, leaving more honey directly above them just seemed like the right thing to do. If two boxes is good, three or four is even better. And then I'll just take my honey in spring, right? That did not work because the cluster was down here. They needed another 10 inches of, of capped honey above them to get through winter. And instead of the 10 inches, I had 16 to 20 inches. So what happens way up here? The warm air comes off this cluster, passive heat, and it condensed onto the cold capped honey up there, which acted like a cold battery. And then on those weird warm up days, we had high humidity and then where did it all go? Dripped right down on all of them. This is why your hive needs to be sized to the occupants. The number of bees you're going into winter with requires you to pack them down more. But if you've got wall to wall bees, maybe an extra super is going to help. But lots of hives with lots of honey above them, lots of boxes and your clusters moderate in size you're going to have a problem with condensation directly above them. So this is, I'm trying not to make this really complicated, but the reason that I only put the food on top of the inner cover in a properly sized hive is because they go up through that hole. And when I take the outer cover off and look at that shim to see if they have the resources they need, and I do it on relatively warm days, you get a weird day where it's 50 or 60 or High 50s and sunny, that's the day to check all of your hive's food resources. We don't need to open the box and look down inside at the bees. I just want to see if they have fauna packs in this case now. All of my Langstroth style hives will have fauna packs on them going into winter this year. And when am I putting them on? This coming week. So they will all have it. Now I can check it and I don't, there's no air coming out of there. I have not had to take off the inner cover and expose all of them and stress them out because just a little shock of cold air works against them. And uh, you'll also hear them whir up. So you hear noise and they'll become active because after all, something has torn open their hive on a cold day in the middle of winter when they're not ready to come out and do what they need to do. I can avoid all of that by putting the resource on top of the inner cover having insulation over that, having that feeder shim insulated, and even the inner cover now is insulated. So it's an insulation sandwich with a hole in the middle and the bees go through and they clean it out really well. So that's where I'm at now and that is working really well. I highly recommend you try it out. And if you have a differing opinion about how that might work or not, what do you think I'm going to suggest? Do some with that configuration and some without. Do a hive with a whole bunch of boxes if you're absolutely convinced that that's the way it's going to be and then you can clean out your dead out in spring. I'm not saying that's an absolute, but I'm just letting you know that the best colonies I had in my apiary ever were killed by me by leaving too many boxes on and creating what I call the super colony. So in spring, I split nothing out of them because they were just soaking wet and dead by spring. There you have it. So I put myself on report right there. So feeder shim, insulated inner cover, no venting on the top, and then insulation over your fondant or your dry sugar, whatever you choose to go with, it should be insulated. And I'm using double bubble now for everything. So that's it. That works. I'm telling you. Now maybe where you live, you need to do something different. I don't know. But try different things. Don't do a shift all at once, and then you'll know. Maybe one thing is working a little better where you are than others. And the genetics of your bees do play at what? The size of the brood that they're going to have and when they're going to do it. So right now, small brood. Moving on, question number four. It took me a long time to get this far. Here comes Peter from Victoria, Australia. So let's see, uh, hello Frederick, Peter, Australia. What research or testing, if any, is presently being done around the world on the eradication of Varroa? As you probably know, it's in Australia. Three years, it will be in most states. Thank you for your time. 
Okay. So I think we all know that Australia now faces the Varroa Destructor Mite, that they were mite free for so long. Good for them. It was fantastic. They had a good run. And um, so the next thing is there are philosophies in how to manage Varroa Destructor Mites. And uh, I never knew personally beekeeping without having to deal with Varroa Destructor Mites. Never did because I started beekeeping in 2006. Then the Varroa Destructor Mite is already here, already an issue, and it's the bulk of what people talk about. So here's something that I did a little research on when I got this question. Is there a country that uh, got mites and then were able to keep bees mite free eventually? Now you find there are philosophy divides in treatment free and then treatment of Varroa Destructor Mites. However, the sad news is once the mites arrived and showed up and were evident in the bees and in the colonies, I could find no evidence that someone had successfully eradicated mites once they were present. There are some examples, and they're usually island examples or outcroppings from mainland areas, where they all agreed to not have mites or all agreed to be treatment free. And uh, if you could find an area that were 100% free of bees and that you did not have bees in 10 miles in every direction, probably more than that, you have the potential to have a colony of bees that uh, has no mites yet. But once the mites come and are established, I could find no model that demonstrated that they were able to 100% eradicate them. It gets worse. I know. So aside from the Varroa destructor mite, there's another mite on the scene that's even worse, and it's called tropolalaps, and some people call it the tropy mite. And uh, Dr. Samuel Ramsey wants to talk about that. The reason is because we still have a chance with that mite. Once they're in your neck of the woods, you're stuck with just management practices. Eradicating the mite next to impossible. And no one's done it yet. So if somebody eventually comes up with that, uh, everybody will want to know about it. And that person is going to be a billionaire overnight. If you come up with a method to completely eradicate the mite without killing the honeybee, you're going to be a superhero to everyone who keeps bees around the world. So let's, uh, that's right now, nobody's been able to do it. A lot of people are working on it. I know somebody's going to say, what about uh, Paul Stamets and his, uh, you know, fungi and, and that's supposed to be able to attack the mite with some kind of microcelium and stuff like that. Um, those are promising, but they can't survive the hive environment yet. And a lot of people are working on it. So there are people working on it because it means huge money. And when something means huge money, it has huge importance to people everywhere. So because if there weren't a lot of uh, agricultural dollars assigned to beekeeping and to the bees themselves, uh, there would be no activity on behalf of the bees when it comes to government level, national level, state level. So um, the other thing is that tropolalaps might. Uh, was very interesting. I may be saying the wrong thing, but it was, I want to say it was Turkey that uh, the tropolalaps might showed up. Um, and you would think that these bees could create a resistance if left untreated. In other words, if we don't engage with miticide and allow the Darwinian approach that some of these colonies would survive, and it didn't, it wiped out the entire bee industry, 100% gone. The tropolalaps might very fast moving little mite, tropy mite. You can put a cute title on it if you want to, but it's a monster. And uh, so we need to be fighting that mite where it is now. We don't need to let it get to our bees elsewhere. We're dealing with enough with the road destructor mite. And I'm sorry that it's in Australia, but now that it is, I think it's there to stay. And now you're just going to divide yourselves among disciplines. I don't know how much the government gets involved in mandating what you can do and can't do when it comes to controlling those mites. But um, not treating the mites requires a lot more activity and a lot more engagement with your bees and integrated pest management protocols would have to be implemented. And it is a full on active way to keep your bees. This is why the treatment group ends up uh, having to be much less involved with the management of their bees because now they can just treat them, get their mites under control and get what they want out of the bees. So we're talking about industry standards, industry practices. So if you look at uh, the Bee Informed Partnerships loss and management surveys, the commercial beekeepers 
have the lowest losses overall. Uh, and then, of course, backyard beekeepers are in there, and uh, backyard beekeepers that are treatment-free have the highest losses percentage-wise. So the commercial beekeepers are treating their colonies, all of them. So they're, I don't know of any, there may be one, there might be an outlier or something that uh, is not treating any of their colonies, but I haven't found a single large-scale beekeeper that provides their bees to pollination areas like the almond groves in California uh, without treating and getting their mites and so forth under control with chemical interventions. And then there's a secondary divide there, whether it's synthetic chemicals or organic chemicals. So then you can have some solstice and thinking that, well, if at least if I'm treating with organic chemicals, that uh, it's somewhat better for the bees because it exists in nature. These are kind of natural things that also require integrated pest management in order to be sufficient to keep your mites under control. And then the synthetics can be very strong, but they also have problems with residue in the wax. Uh, presence in the honey can't be done when honey supers are on, things like that. And so there are all these different things ahead of you in Australia. There are decisions to be made regarding what treatments are, how they'll be implemented, implemented and what the long-term impact is going to be on honey products, the beehive itself, and of course the honeybee. So, I wish there was an example of a country that eradicated the Varroa destructor mite after it got there. Right now I can't find it. If you found one, put the comment down in the video uh, description down in the comment section and uh, shoot me a link. Let me know who did it, how they did it. We all wanna know. Question number five comes from Paula. It says, have you ever left your actual flow super on during winter or do you always take it off and just leave the brood box below? I'm in Montana. It's my first time having bees. I'm originally from Australia, so it's much warmer there. So from Australia to Montana. Okay. So here's the thing. And I've been keeping flow hives and managing them uh, consistently since they came out in 2015. So I think this is my eighth winter. And uh, with the flow hive, the configuration, the way, and what did I start off with today? Use things the way the designer, the inventor told you to use them until it doesn't work and then do your modifications once you realize. Uh, if it does work perfectly, then great. So let's describe first the configuration they want you to use. So in New South Wales, Australia, where the flow hive was invented and is implemented, uh, they have a deep brood box. It will be an eight or a 10 frame box, depending on which one you prefer. There will be immediately above that, after they're established, that's key. Remember what we said about the size of the box, size to the colony of bees. Start off with your deep brood box, which is the flow hive. Uh, let them fill 70 or 80%. Then in New South Wales, I'm gonna make that distinction. They go straight to the honey super, the flow super. What's between it? You'll have a queen excluder there. So when you put your queen excluder on your bottom box, and this practice is also done here in the United States, and I listened to a lecture in person from Steve Rapasky, who was talking about his single brood box management. Made a lot of sense. If you're a commercial beekeeper, you want your brood in one box, it has a queen excluder, Everything above that is a honey super ready to go. In wintertime, what does he do? He packs everything down and the queen excluder can come off because again, it's gonna winter in that single brood box, right? So the flow hive is made for an area where pollen and resources are available year round. And that's why they have the single brood box, queen excluder, honey super. What I do here, and I've done a few videos about that, and there is a page on my website that's called the flow experience or the flow hive experience all of my videos about the flow hive are there um, and i did let them go up into the flow super just to see what would happen so what i did is i do the deep brood box medium super this doesn't matter if it's a flow hive all my langstroth hives go this way in spring the hives that survive winter start off in that brood box when they're filling it out, that's when I'll put a medium super on if they don't already have one. If it's a winter super, it could come off for spring harvesting if you want to. And uh, what I do then is everything above my first two boxes is going to be for my harvesting later in the year. 
So with the flow hives, I always have two boxes before the flow super goes on. There are multiple reasons for why I do that. One is I don't use a queen excluder. So until they establish lots of honey resources in spring. So bees, remember, are doing two things. They're making preparations to survive the coming winter. They're making preparations to produce another colony of bees. That's what they're designed to do. Reproduce, survive. That's it. So then while they're building those resources, once they have those two boxes and I see a nice solid area of honey, the honey bridge, I stopped using queen excluders and now I have the flow super on top of that. We had a very good year with the flow hives this year. Now, we could I just leave them like that and let the bees migrate right up on through and occupy the flow super in wintertime? Well, first of all, that would mean I did not harvest the honey out of the flow super. Because why leave it on if it's empty, right? But because it is a honey super, we empty it in September, first week of September, last couple of weeks of August, and then uh, we take it off. Because if we leave it on and they don't fill it up again, what do I have now above my bees? A big empty space and a harvested super. So that's what I don't want above my bees going into winter. So it comes off. But for argument's sake, I wanted to leave it on when I first got it because a lot of people said the queen won't lay eggs in these plastic frames that are made by Flow Hive because the cells are too deep and they're too large. So the size of these cells is between a worker cell and a drone cell. So not quite as big as a drone cell, not quite as small as a standard worker cell. The other thing is the cells are too deep. That's why when you look at a flow super, they go, well, that's a six and that's a seven. But the six goes on an eight frame deep and the seven goes on a 10 frame deep. These frames are big. So uh, the other thing is the depth of it. The queen probably won't lay her eggs in there. Well, she did all of that. So I left the Queen excluder off, by the way, no matter what your hive configuration is, you must remove your queen excluder for winter. Here's why. The queen has to move up with the cluster. If you've got a queen excluder there, the cluster moves up to where the food is, but now the queen is left down below and she'll have her brood down there and you've just divided your group. You'll need twice as many bees to survive that way. So you always remove your queen excluder going into winter I don't care if it's a flow hive or a standard Langstroth hive, whatever it is, queen excluders get in the way of them migrating through the honey in winter. So those come off with your last honey harvest. But the queen did lay worker eggs in those cells and I posted a video about it. So they laid brood up there. Now, let's say you did that. You weren't thinking, you didn't watch this video. You didn't watch my other videos. You didn't take my advice. And here you are looking at your flow hive and your flow super, those very expensive plastic frames that are designed just for honey, now have brood in it. Are you doomed? You're not. Because here's what I did. Um, when I went down to single entrances, uh, that means on the landing board, single entrance, no venting, no upper entrance. They naturally backfill these upper boxes when spring comes and when the spring nectar flow starts they migrate their brood lower and lower as the year progresses until they end up right back in the landing board area with brood down there. And as they move out of that upper box, now this is, let's just say 90% of the time, there's always gonna be some wise guys in there that don't move. They just stay in the upper boxes and try to make you look bad as a beekeeper. But for the most part, they move down together now here's another way I found out that I could accelerate their movement down into the bottom box. This eliminates also another practice, which is rotating bottom boxes. Because as you get into spring, your brood is up there. And now what happened to the bottom box? The honey and everything's consumed if there was brood in there, which there probably was. You have all these dark brood frames, by the way, which I don't like to see them produce honey in for people. But some people rotate those boxes because you just took the brood up here, you put it on the bottom where the entrance is, and now you have empty frames above them, which uh, gives them more space. It's supposed to help with swarm reduction. And uh, now they'll move back up and refill all of that. I don't do that. One of the ways you can accelerate their movements back down with brood is to keep your entrance small. So if you listen to Dr. Thomas Seeley, 
and you follow that size of that entrance, which I've adopted, by the way, a very small entrance on your landing board gets that cluster to move down quicker because they want their brood to be near where they control the venting and the upper parts become honey supers only. So they clean out those plastic flow cells. They migrate down below. And if you want to make sure they don't get back up there after they've moved out, after all the brood has emerged from those cells, then you can put your queen excluder back under your flow super. And then now all of your brood again is down below the queen excluder. So they will clean it out. They will backfill it with honey later and you're back in business running your flow frames exactly as they were before. So I hope that all of that makes sense. And there was reference here to discussions and everything that were made on the forums. And I don't want to settle anybody's hash. I'm just saying what I use and how I do it and what's worked. And it consistently works. Now, the other thing is some people will say, well, when you showed your video of all your landing boards, uh, some of your landing board entrances are wide open. Others are narrow, but you say to use 3 8 by up to 3 inches in width. That's true, because what did I say in the very beginning? I am watching these hives year after year, season after season, in my own small apiary. And I leave some with wide open entrances because I want to see how they behave, how they arrange their resources. And I want to season after season, year after year, make comparisons, keep my notes, and see how that impacts how much brood they bring down there, how they manage resources inside the hive. And then we can start to correlate configuration, position, entrance size, entrance facing, what direction, screen bottom, not screen bottom, solid bottom, box in bottom, insulated, not insulated, entrance, no entrance, vented, not vented. And then through the years, you arrive ultimately at a very successful configuration that gets the bees to do what you want them to do because you're a beekeeper. So beekeeping is finding ways. And then guess what this really boils down to? In the end, after all this manipulation and changing of equipment and all these entrances and shimming and everything else, we find out that what we're emulating is what Dr. Seely said right along, which is we're imitating the cavities that they occupy in their own and there we have it. And then we think we did it. All we're doing is following what the bees are doing and paying attention to them over ourselves. Question number six comes from Brad. I live in the Northeast and I'm considering wrapping my hives for the first time. By wrapping the hives, I would be keeping the bees warmer and promote a looser cluster all winter. Encouraging them, eating more reserves, or is it the opposite? If not wrapping and allowing the bees experience a cooler environment and cluster tighter, do they go through more food stores this way? I like this question. I like all the questions. All your questions are great. Every question I ever get is fantastic. They're all super. Okay, so here's the thing. Wrapping the hives. But the question is, if they're colder and they're clustered tighter, do they consume more resources than if they were warmer and loose and moving around more? inside the hive? That's an interesting question. Let me throw another monkey wrench into that. The toughest winters here are not the coldest winters. When we get really cold winters, it gets cold, stays cold, everything out in the apiary looks dead. Every hive looks dead, no activity. Too cold for bees, right? Those have been my most successful winters because what happens to the bees is they cluster tight, they go into a state of torpor, they stay in a state of torpor. The lower their metabolism is, and they're just at survival temperature, and in the middle of that cluster, they're working away, doing their thing, and they're consuming their resources directly on that honeycomb. The problem we have is when we get a warm week. So we go from 25 degrees Fahrenheit to a weird series of days where it's in the 50s and low 60s and bees are doing cleansing flights. The cleansing flights are great for them, but it, the change doesn't transition slowly. So in other words, we'll go from a 55 or 60 degree day and by 10 o'clock that same night is 27 degrees Fahrenheit. That is a hammer. So these fluctuations in temperature, much harder on the bees, right? So the insulated inner cover, um, 
is as far as I've had to go here. Although I have to say I'm implementing the Dr. Leah Sharashkin insulated hides are over there. We've got now the Apame hives, which this winter will have insulated tops on them with no venting through the top because the venting I wasn't a fan of and the bees are not a fan of it where I live. Maybe where you live, they want it. They love the venting. Where I live, they propolize it. The supervisor was here. He's eight years old. He pointed out all the propolis everywhere, how the bees don't want venting. He's very keen that way. So here's the thing. Um, the bees are doing very well with just wooden sides. Now, does that mean they would not do better if we wrapped them or insulated them? Sidewalls. I do want to say what I say over and over again, and it bears repeating now. If you insulate anything, your inner cover should be the insulated point. Everything directly over your bees, there should be an insulated cap on your hive that does not relieve the warm air from the hive. There should be no passive ventilation going on. All ventilation, in my opinion, should be under the control of your honeybees. There are many, many reasons for that. So insulated sidewalls, this was a puzzle for me. I got a hive that was heavily insulated on the sidewalls. The cover, however, had no insulation on it. The way it came from the manufacturer. Now, um, and the, hi the hive top was vented. I left it that way, killed my bees. So now can I say that's exactly what killed the bees and nothing else? I don't know, maybe I wasn't that good at it, who knows. But when I insulated that hive cover, when I took away the ventilation on the top, I had profound success with that configuration. So when you're looking at the R value, the insulation value of the sidewalls of your hive, as long as your cover has a higher R value than the sidewalls, you don't run the risk of achieving the dew point on the interior surface of your hive above your cluster of your bees. You want the dew point to be at the lower portion of the cluster of your bees or below them, not above. Wherever cold air meets warm air or a cold surface meets warm air, you get a dew point, you have condensation. We want to avoid that inside your hive at or above your cluster. So insulating the top needs to be higher than the insulation value of your sidewalls. So bees that get clustered, stay clustered, consume very little resources. It's very interesting. Bees that move around that have more activity. Here's the bonus to that. They have access to more resources because instead of that tight cluster moving up, like, like creeping up really slow in a looser cluster, they access more frames of honey. So if they access more resources then, and you left enough on, I used to leave 74 to hundred pounds of honey on. These days I get through winter with less than 40 pounds of honey. And uh, that's even on large colonies. So insulation, helps. Now wrapping hives, I haven't done it. I haven't gotten that far because I'm doing incremental changes in how I manage my colonies. And if I've arrived at a point that brings me to springtime with colonies that are trying to swarm before I'm even ready for them to do it, I don't want them to be more ready than they currently are. Plus they're leaving a lot of unconsumed resources in the hive. So for me here, northeastern United States, northwest Pennsylvania, I'm at a sweet spot in the way my colonies are. Even observation hives in an unheated building in triples, so triple frames, triple frames, triple frames. Uh, I just put hot pockets over them. So what I did is I took that double bubble that I started with last year and I made like a pillowcase and just put it over the top of the observation hive. That's all I did. It sat in an unheated building. Every one of them came into spring too strong. Swarm strength. That's what, if you're a backer beekeeper, you don't necessarily want that. We're fighting the tide. They want to swarm. That's what they want to do. So anyway, um, for Brad and for anybody else who's insulating or wrapping your hives for the first time, uh, this is where keeping records is important. When you keep records about how much they consume, the size of the colony, what their disposition was, and what the origin of the colony was, and so on, um, you're going to find out year after year how these things benefit them, how many resources they consume, 
this is the other important part. Part of your documentation in your log has got to be the weather. So if you notice, every Friday I start off telling you what my weather conditions are. I'm building my own uh, documentation about how my bees are responding to different weather conditions. And when we think we got a really strong year, we have to look realistically about how the winter went and what the weather conditions were. What did your bees go through? And my worst winters by far are those that were hot and cold and had these dramatic fluxes in hot and cold temperatures. Some of the worst winters we've had when we set a record for over 100 inches of snowfall, my bees did the best. So, so moving on, you're gonna have to try it, Brad. And here's what I recommend. Do one and do not do another. Make comparisons. Let us know how it worked. Question number seven. This comes from Dot Miller 6382 That's the YouTube channel name. Regarding doing OA at the end of November, early December, aren't your temps below 48 degrees? I have done OA through Christmas in southern New Hampshire and mites were still dying. Is there an outside temperature at which you are wasting your time doing OA. So the first thing I want to talk about is oxalic acid. That's what OA is. Oxalic acid vaporization can be done at any temperature, but here's the thing. Uh, we want to look for our warmest days to do it. So we need to know if you, I realize I have a lot of gadgets, so I have thermal scanners, right? So I can use my FLIR and I can look at the side of the the beehive and I can see if the whole thing is really red and heated up, those bees are spread out in there. If it looks like a little cluster and I have the orange in the middle and then I have the yellow and then it, it goes out from that, uh, they're in a tight cluster. So when I do oxalic acid vaporization, my goal is to get that vapor on every bee I can, particularly in the brood area. And this time of year, those nurse bees, right? So if you're looking at your calendar, and uh, why did we even choose end of November, first of December? Historically, that's when we find uh, the smallest brood in our colonies. The reason for that is when we do not have brood or we do not have more specifically pupa state bees, and those are bees with caps on their cells. Uh, when they have caps on their cells, you do your oxalic acid vaporization. Any mites that are inside those cells do not get hit. So we get our greatest effectiveness of the oxalic acid treatment during the lowest brood periods. This is why it works so well as a prevention when you get a swarm of bees, because what happened? You collect a swarm of bees, you put them in a hive. Even if that queen starts laying the minute you put them in that hive, you're not gonna have capped brood for eight days, right? So on the seventh day after hiving a swarm, you can do a single oxalic acid treatment and get according to the experts, 96% effectiveness on your phoretic or dispersal phase mites because they can't hide yet. If you wait until after they're under those cappings and they're in the pupa state, your oxalic acid vapor will not contact those mites and now we have reproductive mites in a brand new colony. You have great opportunities when you collect a swarm of bees. If you give them that treatment after they've set up house in the hive, they made a commitment, they started laying eggs, they're moved in. Because if you do it right away, you risk absconding. They're just gonna leave. You just hit them with oxalic acid, they don't like it, they're out of there. So we get them committed, we get them to lay their eggs, we get them to develop the brood, and before they can cap the brood, we hit them with oxalic acid, 96% effective, and you've got a fantastic new colony for your apiary. Okay. Now, here we are. All our beehives are out here. By the way, earlier this year, it was really exciting because I thought, man, nobody has mites. How many people had low mites? Everybody would raise their hand. How many people are doing ones and twos? Everybody raised their hand. It was really great. We were in a mite-free year. I thought something happened. I thought some secret thing happened to the Varroa destructor mite and they were all dying out. I only had one colony that required treatment. Now didn't I get it? Because here we are, we had a super warm week last week, week before, my counts were all high, all of them, all of them. My observation hives, observation hives that had no mites in them, in other words, none of the counts showed mites. 
No mites on bottom boards, no mites on inserts all summer long. They all have mites now. I don't know how they got here, but I know that the bees are drifting in wild ways, in large percentages. I know that the ability for a colony to die out or get robbed, and then for mites to disperse from the robbed hive. If you've got a bunch of beekeepers around you, you don't know what they're doing, you don't know what their mite levels were. All I know is now I have mites, now I have to treat. I did a treatment round, oxalic acid. Not ideal, because they also have a bunch of capped brood and everything, right? So they're all showing up. What else is happening? They're getting rid of all the drones. They're killing off the drones. If you had mites on the bodies of the drones, where are they going now? On the bodies of your worker bees. What are you counting? Worker bees. Could be a correlation. So with colonies at the end of the year being robbed out by larger, more substantial colonies, colonies failing, queens dying, I have philosophy about the queens dying too. When you get a colony of bees and the queen dies, I think they're prone to robbing. I think they're not as defensive as they otherwise would be. With the queen gone, what do they do? I think most of them drift away. And by that, I mean those workers leave that high. There's no new um, worker bees in there. The queen pheromone is absent. They come across another queen pheromone. They move into that hive. That's what I think is happening. Do I have science to back it up? No. I have observations. Just watching bees do what they do. And if they're joining a bunch of other hives, the colony without the queen is dwindling more and more, less defensive, incapable of protecting their resources, getting robbed silly. That's what I think is happening. They go queenless, they get robbed, they all move out, they all move in with everybody else in the community. And so now, if they had varroa destructor mites, they're moving in with them. So, in November, warm day, you want the warmest day. 50 degrees and sunny, that would be enough. 60 degrees and cloudy, that would be enough. What time of day do you want to do it? Middle of the afternoon, between 12 and 2. Why? On a warm day, if they're foraging out, the foragers are not your nurse bees. Because people say, well, you missed all the foragers. Right. But guess what I did? They were out of the way. I had access to more of the nurse bee area. So if I can hit them on that one warm afternoon, and it doesn't matter if they're flying or not, but if we know that that cluster is open, right? Because it could be even a rainy day, but it's warm enough. You can hear the hive. You can hear how active they are. If it's a dead quiet hive, you can assume they're pretty tightly clustered. In fact, uh, my supervisor, the eight-year-old, said that uh, he thought a nucleus hive was completely dead, but I made him put his ear up against the side of the hive. And uh, sure enough, they're alive in there. They're just humming, right? So when they have a loose cluster, they're prone for treatment. So if you're looking at the, the weather map, because the weather people know exactly what the weather's going to be doing even five days from now, right down to half a degree, they know exactly what's going to happen. And uh, so when they tell you that it's going to be 63 degrees at 2 o'clock on Thursday afternoon, get your OA gear ready and go get them all. All of them. Treat all of your hives. I don't care if you have a golden colony. This is I know I'm saying that like I'm telling you that's what you absolutely will do. But um, you don't have to do it. I mean, if you don't want your bees to live, you don't have to do it. So what I'm saying is, this is what I'm going to do when I get that warm day. Last week of November, first week of December, whatever's the warmest day in there, they're all getting the oxalic acid vaporization treatment because the combination of low brood, warmer temps, spread out cluster. I'm going to hit those row destructor mites. I'm not even going to care that they're all dead on the bottom board with their little feet in the air. Not even going to care. Funny thing happened to me at one of the uh, clubs at the annual banquet, and I didn't bring it with me, I was going to show it to you, but I was handed a gift, and it was a tiny bottle, and when the guy handed it to me, he goes, that's for you, and I look at that, and it looked like a little bottle of cinnamon or something, it was full of dead burrow destructor mites, it's a very sad moment. So anyway, OA, yes, the advantages, loose cluster, more surface area. It gets them, kills the mites. We want all mites to die, every one of them. We want them dead, even the baby mites. You don't have to worry about the males. They never make it out of the cell anyway. Only the females come out. Founders mites in particular, get them first. All right, moving on, number eight. That's enough violence. This is Dwayne from Nina, Wisconsin. Just a follow-up question to honey storage. If I jar the honey and freeze it in glass... 
Do I risk glass breakage? Okay. I'm going to say no. So here's the thing. We're going to freeze it. Why would we freeze it anyway? Well, because it's going to preserve your honey the best. So anyway, when it comes to honey in the jar and you're putting it in the freezer, if you want to hold that in its most pristine, flavorful state, the freezer is a great place for it. Zero degrees Fahrenheit on average, depending on how you set up your freezer. Does the honey freeze? No, it really doesn't. Not at that temperature. So the thing is, what causes this rapid expansion and contraction of liquids when you put them in the freezer? Water. The amount of water, right? So we already know that honey is well below, it's below 18% water for most of you. Okay, so the amount of expansion of that, very minimal. The other thing is, keep in mind, it's not freezing the honey. Okay. So when you freeze it, we want to make sure that every honey jar that you've got your honey in has, uh, if you listen to the people that judge honey, I think you have to fill it to that first little glass ring on uh, the top of your jar, if it's a mason jar, a ball jar, right? And so that means you left about a half inch air gap above it. That's important to have, room for expansion without destroying anything. The other thing is you don't want your jar of honey to be sitting on its side. Sometimes when you're freezing things to save space, Maybe you're putting them on the side. I recommend keeping them upright in there. The other thing is, if you want to cut down on the amount of shock or the rapid change, it could cause glass to be stressed, right? I run it through a stage first in the fridge, then to the freezer. So in the fridge overnight, freezer the following morning. Same thing when you're taking them out of the freezer. Out of the freezer, into the fridge, or a cooler where they can sit in the cooler and gradually warm up. These gradual changes will take some of the stress. If you've got a discontinuity in that glass jar somewhere, it can create a stress point. And if you do a rapid warm up or rapid cool down, that stress point can become a crack. You could have a huge mess, right? So, uh, so thought slowly, freeze it slowly, blah, blah, blah. And that's it. I don't know if anyone who's ever if you ever broke a jar of honey in your freezer, let us know what happened. What was the determination there? What was going on? Question number nine comes from Dwayne. Nina, Wisconsin. Did I already say Nina, Wisconsin? We sure did. This is Dwayne snuck in another one here. How long... Okay, so this is another honey temperature question, and this is appropriate because a lot of you are storing honey right now. My grandson, the honey boy, I've named him, is the front man for selling our honey now. So he's having very good success. 100% success selling honey door to door. No one has turned him down. I think that's very enterprising. It's fantastic. Who could resist an eight year old honey boy who's got a jar of original raw honey? Moving on. Okay, how long and at what temperature is it safe? Okay, to keep honey in a warmer without degrading the honey. Example. Can it be left in a warmer for six months to a year at 100 degrees to stop crystallization? Okay, so here's the thing. You could put honey in a warmer at 100 degrees for six months to a year to stop crystallization, but it's going to taste bland. All the sensitive aspects of the honey are going to be gone. It is going to remove the floral, the wonderful floral scent that it has. You're going to hurt your honey. At 100 degrees, it is not going to be unsuitable. It's still honey. It's probably still good to go. But uh, for that long, the longer you have it warm like that, um, the less appeal it's going to have to people. Flavor, scent, all that stuff, right? And so some people might say, yeah, but inside a beehive, it could be 94 to 97. It could be 100 degrees inside that beehive for extended periods of time. Yeah, because the bees don't care uh, what it smells like. They just want the carbs. They want to be able to consume it, build wax with it, use energy, right? So the other thing is, so, you know, what should you do? So we already talked about, we mentioned um, keeping it in the freezer. That is the number one spot to keep it from degrading. Okay, so maybe you don't want to take up freezer space. Now, somebody did write me over the past week and said, hey, those hive butlers are like $79 or whatever they are. You could buy a freezer for roughly that price, a horizontal freezer, um, and put all your honey and stuff in there. So that was interesting, but if you're running the freezer, you're paying the energy to cool it. 
So I don't know if it's talking about just for storage as a storage space, but Hive Butlers are very handy for a lot of different things. But um, freezers, I guess the bottom line is they're very inexpensive. Um, so anyway, putting in the freezer, zero degrees Fahrenheit, which is 18 degrees Celsius, by the way, uh, that arrests everything. So let me tell you another example of where that's helpful to the backyard beekeeper who has a lot of space. If your honey's too wet, right, it can ferment. Once it starts to ferment, you open up a, you know, a box or something that's got a bunch of frames in it and it smells sour, it smells like it's fermenting, the water content was too high, it's ruined. You can't reverse that, right? But what you can do is put it in a freezer until you have a chance to set it up where you can dehydrate things, right? And so at freezer temperatures, it won't ferment. So you have, if you have high moisture content honey, it won't ferment. Now, um, it also doesn't crystallize. It's going to preserve all the florals. It's going to... All the subtle benefits of honey are preserved at those cold temperatures. Now, I'm not saying you have to do that. Most people are going to get their honey. They're going to put it in jars. They're going to put it on the shelf. So if you're just putting it on the shelf, you're going to get it for a long time, right? Honey is not going to spoil in your lifetime, provided it's dry enough. Other than that, you're good to go. I would keep it out of sunlight. I know a lot of people like to see the sun streaming through the honey, and they put it on their shelves, uh, or they put it on the windowsill in the kitchen so they can see all that great honey. That is a fantastic way to degrade your honey. So... Darkness is your honey's friend, so you want to put that in your pantry or whatever, room temperature, it's going to be okay. And even if it starts to crystallize, let it go ahead and finish crystallizing. And then if you want to take it out and then use it for something else later, you can warm it back up, you can restore it to its liquid state, or you can just scoop it as crystallized honey. But keeping it at 100 degrees for extended periods of time will degrade so many things that are very appealing about floral specific honey. So airtight, by the way, too, because remember it's hygroscopic. If you have high humidity in the area where you're storing your honey, it can actually take on moisture. So that's it for today. We're in the fluff section now. And uh, oh yeah, coming up this Wednesday, which is November 1st, a lot of people want to know if I would ever do a live chat so we can answer questions in real time. So here's the thing. I'm not hosting it. Someone called the Bush Bee Man, who's in Australia, has invited me to chat, to do a live stream. And we're going to do it November the 1st, which is Wednesday, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I hope that you'll join the Bush Bee Man. Easy to find. Google Bush Bee Man. Go to the YouTube channel. And then he has live streams. So highly recommend you join us for that. I think we're going to be talking about Varroa Destructor Mites. Who knows what else? I have a lot of questions for him, but he's the host, so he's going to run it. And uh, I hope you'll be there. Ask your questions. Say hello. Talk to each other. Have fellowship. I doubt that there'll be anything going on for your bees on that day. So the other thing is uh, plan of the week for your own backyard apiary. Um, the robbing pressure, the potential for robbing right now is extremely high. For the reasons that I described, the environment's not providing what they need. The temperatures are warm enough for them to be flying around. They're pinging on every hive. So if you see a lot of activity at one of your beehives and the rest of them are not very active, check it out. They might be getting robbed. If they get robbed this time of year, that's a colony that's doomed. They're just not going to make it through winter. The other thing is, is a great opportunity while the weather is still good, what few days we have, go around and look at all your hives. Check the alignment. Make sure that each box is married up just right. Look to see if you see little faces in between there. If you might have messed it up and not put those boxes together just right. When you stack your boxes, you know they're heavy, and sometimes it's hard to realign them. Don't hit it. Don't go out there with a rubber mallet and, and pound them over and things like that. I use bar clamps, the kinds with the screw threads on them. And I just line it up. Like if this box is shifted, lower box is over here, I put the bottom of it over here and the upper side up here, and then I just turn it, and it very gradually glides them into alignment. Then you take your bar, bar clamp off. Bees don't care. Movements like that that are slow and steady, you can align them on their bottom boards, anything else. Fix them up. The other thing is, it's a great time of year now to make sure that everything is strapped down good. Also, um, look at your landing boards. Tilt slightly towards the landing board. 
it is extraordinary how much moisture your bees can generate inside a hive on the sidewalls and then we get these warm-ups and it all goes right to the bottom if your hive is tilted back at all especially these solid bottom boards they're number one uh, you want to tilt them slightly towards the front and you'll see staining on the wood where this water has run out it's much more water than you think would exist inside a hive so we want that to, to leave the hive. The other thing is if you've got screen bottom boards with pull-out trays underneath of them, great opportunity, pull all your trays, clean them all out. And remember that what I recommend is have multiple trays. So when you go out there and you pull a tray out, you're putting a clean one in right away. This gives you an opportunity to evaluate the contents of the tray, look to see if you have varroa mites, if you've recently given a treatment, document the drop, and you'll understand that uh, you had some ef effective treatment going on there. And uh, also some people, this isn't something that I do because I don't treat with strips and things like that. Make sure you're not leaving mite treatments inside your hives through winter. I know it's easy to forget. They're on there, you think the treatment is done. It doesn't hurt to just leave the, the product still in there uh, through the rest until you pull the hive apart again. But I highly recommend you do not leave any quick strips or pads or anything in your hive that's part of a mite treatment. I would remove all of that. So the next really popular question that I get is when to put fondant packs on. As I mentioned this coming week, all my hives are getting fondant packs. So I'm putting the Hive Alive fondant packs on. If you know how to make your own fondant, that's going to save you time. It's going to save you money. It's not going to save you time. But uh, for people that can do that, you get the kitchen, you trust yourself. I don't trust myself to, to make it. But, um, and Hive Live was out of stock. So I don't know if they're back in stock or not. I will say, just for my viewers, if you want to follow what I'm personally doing, uh, I don't put pollen patties on my hives fall, winter, or spring. Uh, keep in mind that it's, I have a great environment where I am, that I'm not earning a living with my bees, so I'm not a pollinator. Um, all I have are a variety of different hive configurations and I'm enjoying the bees, observing the bees, studying them, learning about them. Uh, I might have a different approach if I needed more bees and I had to make the grade to go out and provide pollination services. So that's why I target backyard beekeeping. This is for your own fulfillment and hopefully so that you have the satisfaction of seeing your bees get through winter. So for me, that's it. Fondant, the horizontal hives are getting nothing. They have lots of resources. The long langstroth, the lands, observation hives, um, no feed on them. We had syrup on them uh, two weeks ago just because they had all swarmed. They all had new queens and they were low on brood and they were building up. So I did that to boost them a little bit. And now they'll get their hot pockets and that's it. And we just hope for the best going into spring. So tilt, align hives, cinch them up, be ready for storms. And uh, I think that's about it. So I want to thank you for being with me today. If you want to post your own question, then please write down in the comment section down below or go ahead and follow that link to thewaytobe.org and click on the page also titled The Way to Be. Some of you may be wondering about my shirt. I designed it myself recently, and I posted that, and of course, it's on Teespring. So, if you like this hoodie, I'm going to leave the shirt uh, link down in the video description below also. So, thank you to those of you who support me in that way. So, I hope you have a fantastic weekend ahead, and it is crunch time. Don't let your bees get robbed. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.